investing in a stronger and more secure economy. This is probably one of the most extensive group of reforms by the government based on sheer volume and so will be split into two parts. The first is renewable technology in the environment, the second will be commercial and industrial. Part two, agriculture, industry growth programs, supporting small businesses. From the days of yams and native wheat to lackadaisical sheep, laborious wheat and arduous cattle growing, agriculture has been an important basis for this continent's economy. There have been changes and reforms to how it's being managed by the government. Tonight on Biosecurity. A total of $1 billion will be thrown at a new biosecurity system over the next four years, along with another $260 million every year after. This produce needs to go under risk analysis before being processed. The biosecurity patrol will now be using country of origin to determine the risk of the product. The product might then have to go under quarantine and surveillance to be checked on for diseases by experts. Hey guys, did you know that in Tasmania, family members are the only things getting wet? The government intends to increase water security for Tasmanian farming using the National Water Grid Fund, a national infrastructure investment program. The government has funded two perfectly compatible schemes to unlock Tasmania's true potential in sustaining big growth. $109 million towards the Northern Midlands Irrigation Scheme, including 25 gigalitres of irrigation water affecting farmers in places from Campbelltown to Longford. $62.1 million for the Sassafras West Lee Vale Irrigation Scheme, which will include 14 gigalitre boost to keep the 19,000 hectares involved perfectly wet. In a dry country like Australia, greatly increasing our base stats for water security and having access to irrigation defense will allow us to be more rough with our water. As much as I hate the name, the federal government is going to make the Bureau of Meteorology become the bomb. The bomb.com. $32.7 million will be invested to develop data and information systems by the Bureau of Meteorology for water funding in the Murray Darling. This will additionally help implement the Murray Darling Basin Plan. Between about Nain Gorn to saving the country's largest and most important water system, this has got to be one of the biggest departmental glow ups of the decade. Climate change will make farming more difficult. There's no doubt about it. What is the government doing about this? The Department of Agriculture has $38.3 million to spend over four years to enhance the capacity of the government to assist farmers with dealing with climate change impacts and better manage agricultural data. Using the Australian Bureau of Agricultural Resource Economics and Sciences, ABARS, the department's research wing, about $16 million will be spent on simply improving data in the region. 9.4 to collect information on low emission methods and tech used by farmers, and 12.8 million to look into the effects of international emissions policies on Aussie agriculture. All policies designed to give farmers access to the best information. This policy will not solve all the problems that climate change will have on the industry, but it will be a start. Industry growth. $392.4 million will be spent on something called the Industry Growth Program. This program is designed to give funding and advice to small and medium businesses in specific areas like renewables, medicine, transport and agriculture. The program will contain experienced advisors to guide small businesses and independent committee responsible for granting funding, centre of expertise and additional sources of industry advice from the not-for-profit sector. This means that if you have a good idea for a business in the area, you might have a great opportunity to get started off the bat. Australia's gone through a new industrial revolution. The National Reconstruction Fund is a $15 billion plan to rebuild Australia's industry, which currently sits at the bottom of the OECD for self-sufficiency and intends to grow to $30 billion by partnering with businesses. Through a series of loans and guarantees, Australia will realise grand plans to manufacture its own transport and renewables, research medicine, localised defence manufacturing and greatly boost specialist sectors like IT, along with already strong sectors like mining. With plans like these, not only will Australia become less dependent on the world for all its materials, it may very well become become the key nation others must appeal to in order to get vital components they need to make with things like windmills, batteries and trains. 
Australia will now produce nuclear technology, not for power or weapons though, but for medicine. The construction of a nuclear medicine manufacturing facility has been announced by the government to protect the rare radiopharmaceutical Technetium 99M from supply chain issues like those caused during the pandemic, allowing nuclear imaging for diseases affecting half of Australians to continue without interruption. The process uses a reactor to fission uranium and produce molybdenum 99 which is extracted, purified and placed in a special generator that extracts the Technetium 99M from it. The purpose of this facility is not only to meet domestic supply but also attempt to fill international demand for the sought after material. So if ever you get mad sick there's a 50-50 chance you might have nuclear medicine to thank for figuring it out. The Australian government wants to use its military budget to invest in new technologies. $3.4 billion will be spent to establish the Advanced Strategic Capabilities Accelerator, AXA, designed to transform defence innovation. This investment is in response to the Defence Strategic Review, which advocated for the Army to have stronger links to newer technology. The main technologies that will be focused on include hypersonics, directed energy, trusted autonomy, quantum technology, information warfare and long-range fires. Sounds like weapons. Australia is waltzing its way to a new and advanced military tech, one of which is hypersonics which are devices capable of reaching speeds faster than Mach 5 at heights below 90 kilometers. Called at times game changers in warfare by people like Stephen Simon of the New York Times and treated with caution by ANU International Relations Fellow Benjamin Zala. This technology has been around for decades, but recent changes have seen newer missiles be far more maneuverable, with most of the great powers like US and China already developing them as a means to compromise an adversary's nuclear capabilities. It has a lot of defensive potential. Australia is literally entering the space age with its military looking into this new tech, directed energy. In this case, it refers to high energy laser, HEL, and high powered radio frequency, HPRF, weapons. So literally laser weapons. Straight up, the government <laughs> wants to make laser guns. Although still primitive in functionality, the application of this technology is not hard to imagine. Already the United States has used this type of technology successfully, with the Athena laser weapon taking down 5 UAVs and 60 kilowatt Helios laser weapon system being added to a USA destroyer. Most applications appear to be in dealing with electronics, which is certainly useful in the modern day. You ever wonder if completely automated weapons like those turrets you see in Portal and Half-Life could be real? Well, Australia might be the one to show it off. Trusted autonomy, completely automated weapons and robots like mind clearing devices support droids in automated underwater vessels. According to the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, there is a lot of technical issues surrounding automated weapon systems that make its reliability still unachievable. The applications of artificial intelligence in defense of the nation, along with possible civilian applications of technology, make it a prime field of research to ensure the country's prosperity. A unique way of doing real fast math has finally piqued the interest of the Australian military. Quantum technology, $40.2 million will be added on top of AXA to research quantum computing in ways that meet needs, fill markets and can be achieved. Quantum computers are experimental devices that use the weird properties of subatomic particles to do calculations. The different way that these computers are able to do these computations means that certain calculations are done much faster than normal computers. The National Quantum Strategy set the goal for Australia to develop the world's first era corrected quantum computer. Quantum computers are highly sensitive to the outside world and can lose coherence and become corrupt. Making the first error correcting computer will be monumental in making quantum computers useful. You are not immune to propaganda and the Australian government knows it. Which is why the military has invested in Information warfare. The world moving from an industrial to an information age means that the government intends to increase its influence and status in both protecting Australia from foreign propaganda and spreading information to other countries. In the industrial age, people directly controlled their physical environment. If you had a car, you'd drive it with a steering wheel and a stick. If you had a gun, you'd shoot and reload with the trigger and clip. With information environments, there is a non-physical element in between. You give commands to a software, which then gives a command to the machine. Being able to manipulate that in-between space is the main focus of the military. When you live in an isolated continent, you need your weapons to have range, and the Australian military knows it. Long-range fires. Long-range strike missiles used to fire at targets far from the launch location would be sensible for the defense of a large and isolated country like Australia, a sentiment reflected by the Defense Strategic Update. The government wants to acquire the ability to produce A2AD system missiles like the Land 8113 Long Range Fires, which will have a range over 500 kilometers. Comrades, 
$286 million to initiate a five-year plan through a new Australian art, entertainment and culture could revive. Following five pillars to greatly leap the glorious Australian entertainment industry forward. First Nations first, a place for every story, centrality of the artist, strong cultural infrastructure, and engaging the audience. Support the small business. Replacing the previous government's business tax break snuck in during the pandemic, $20,000 instant asset write-offs will be available for businesses with less than $10 million of annual income. Asset write-offs are claims on the amount paid in taxes on an item purchased for use in business. Anything from industrial ovens or for your restaurants to even video game skins for your channel. This change increases the amount of money businesses can claim on their tax for equipment, $20,000 instead of a grand, while limiting what businesses can make those claims. Those making under $10 million are now eligible rather than those making up to $500 million in annual turnover. Big companies like Coca-Cola and Boeing can't write off billions in assets anymore. And now the more local businesses can make claims on expensive and important commercial equipment. Estimated to cost $290 million over four years in cash flow support, this policy is much cheaper than the previous version. One thing I always thought funny about America was how stressful they found taxes there. It seems so much easier in Australia, and even easier it will become. It will now be even quicker to interact with the ATO. Paperwork duplication will be combated through changes to the single touch payer or SDB system, giving tax agents the authority to act on the business's behalf for longer periods of time. Additional tax clinics will be opened, with at least two delivered through tape. These clinics have students studying tax related courses to provide supervised tax advice for free. The federal government has announced several policies to ensure a safe and secure cyberscape for small businesses. $2 billion will be invested in ICT to ensure digital services are accessible for people and businesses. $23.4 million will be spent to increase cybersecurity for businesses by training people in a business on basic cyber safety. Cybersecurity being responsible for about $33 billion in reported losses. $88 million to support consumer data rights, CDR. CDR is an opt-in service for specific sectors that allows you to upload your data securely in order to make comparing products and services easier. The government wants to make apprenticeships easy to obtain. Australia has seen a reduction of trade apprenticeships by almost 20,000 since 2012. This has led to massive skill shortages, including in the construction industry, which is greatly impacting the housing affordability crisis as there isn't enough people to build houses. Improvements to apprenticeship support services will be made with the goal of increasing completion rates of skills, which will get them in the workforce. The plan will include assessments of each apprenticeship's needs, increasing their accessibility of mentorship making existing support services more proactive, giving employees improved learning tools, implementing technology and furthering workplace experience options. This was committed in the Jobs and Skills Summit and announced in the 2023 budget. Remember the old reading writing hotline? One three double oh six triple five oh six. Good times. Well, it seems the government is spending more on programs like these. Expanding the foundation skills training to ensure Australians 15 years and over have the basic language, literacy, numeracy, and digital skills needed to participate in future work and education, known as foundation skills. Roughly three million working age Australians lack basic skills expected from employers. Programs considered a part of foundation skills training include the Skills for Education and Employment Program, C. Near universally accessible training for basic literacy and numeracy skills and foundation skills for your future program, which supports employed and recently unemployed Australians who need flexible training to improve basic skills. Apprentices will be everywhere now. The new Australia Skills Guarantee will ensure one out of 10 workers in government construction and ICT jobs will be in an apprenticeship or trainee. Starting with major construction and IT sectors, this guarantee intends to expand to every notable sector of trade in the country. Although yet to be implemented, key design and implementation timeframes have been announced in the latest budget, and over 100 organisations and professionals have been consulted on how to do this. This program intends to prevent the major skill shortage facing the country, like those in construction, which is reducing housing supply and one of the many reasons that stable accommodation has become more difficult in recent years. 
Negotiating with states for a five-year national skills agreement, NSA, to strengthen the VET sector for critical and emerging industries. If these negotiations are successful, funding will be available for reform in areas like foundation skills, fee-free TAFE courses, equality programs, and many more. Increasing and retaining a teacher supply, strengthening their education, and elevating them as a profession. Those are the key priority areas in the federal government's National Teacher Workforce Action Plan. Expanding on $328 million on the previous budget, $9.3 million will be added to the National Teacher Workforce Action Plan, including assistance and guidance for early career teachers. Although this reflects an attempt to fix one of the greatest issues facing the teaching sector at the moment, the AARE says more needs to be done to address other concerns like compensation for pre-service teachers taking professional placements and the need to upgrade and maintain school infrastructure. Government-wide daddy daycare. Finding a place to dump your kids before their school years is a difficult task. As someone who has worked at creation in the past, I know how unbearably exhausting kids can be. Childcare centres are more needed than ever when it, often parents need two incomes to get by. So what's the government doing about it? $72.4 million will be spent to support early childhood education training, including $34.4 million to support educators' professional development and $37.9 million to give financial assistance to educators in getting bachelor or postgraduate degrees. This new policy intends to affect 80,000 childhood educators, many from the regions. The package will include backfilling positions and upskilling existing educators to meet the demand for more childcare. It's 